Right, hello everybody um, and welcome. Welcome to our fifth event in the Open Innovation Series. Um, this is all about accelerating innovation with low code or no code. Um, we're now, for those of you who aren't familiar with our Open Innovation Series, we've really created it to shine a light on open innovation in London and those who are really driving innovation. Today we're joined by Tanvir, who's the head of innovation at UST, who's going to explore how low code or no code technology can be used and is being used by innovators to build digital products without using a single line of code. So I'm very excited about this. He's going to share how it's being leveraged by, by startups, by corporates, and really helping to build that value for customers that we're all trying to achieve. He's an incredible innovator. Uh, and because of this, uh, we selected him to join our first cohort of the London and Partners Open Innovation Fellowship. This fellowship um, is really pulls together a number of innovators. And in the first cohort, he was there with Fortnum and Mason, Schneider Electric, Arup, TFL, and, and many others, as you can see from here. It's a, what the fellowship is, it's a four month executive education program and a networking group, which is really designed specifically for senior innovators who really want to be part of a community that can drive change. The fellows discover how to make their innovation practices more inclusive, more diverse, and more importantly, how they as senior level in individuals within their organization can work together to drive forward powerful transformational innovation across London and beyond. They get to learn about innovation canvases, they get to learn about how to disseminate that innovation when they get back into their own organisations. What's really exciting for us is that collaboration that we've already started to see between the fellows and what's already being created as a result of that. Um, we'll hopefully be able to share some of that in the next session and the next event that we do. And we'll invite Tamria back for him to tell us more on this when he's allowed to talk more publicly about it. But the fellowship itself is run in partnership with the Royal College of Art. Um, the fellows who take part graduate with knowledge of open innovation theory, um, extensive network of senior innovators, and also they feel empowered to enact open innovation. As I said, that is inclusive and diverse. Um, and also they get to understand what role place and community plays in innovation and they get to meet different parts of the London ecosystem that is driving innovation. So for those of you who are interested, cohort three is going to launch later this year in October. Lauren Quigley, who are you going to hear from shortly because she's going to be in conversation with Tanvir, she's going to stay on, answer any questions that any of you might have in case you would like to be part of this amazing fellowship. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to this virtual stage um, Tanvir, who's head of innovation at UST. He's going to give you a full introduction of this low code and explain how you can use it, platforms that you can use, and also provide a bit of a demo. And then, as I said, he'll have a conversation with Lauren. Um, and then just a bit of further context, he heads up innovation practice at UST, where he works on the emerging technology across fintech, regtech, health tech sectors, all these really fantastic growth sectors for London. He splits his time talking to stakeholders um, across a variety of clients, technology experts across UST, but he brings them all together in order to accelerate innovation. So absolutely thrilled to have you with us, Tanvir. Um, I'm going to hand over to you so you can give your short talk and your demo. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Janet. Uh, it's, a, it's a genuine pleasure to be here, everyone. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to just pop my screen on and kick this session off. Brilliant. So, um, so just just in terms of uh, where I've been, um, so been with USD for about eight years, of which the last three to four years have been spent on no code and low code tech. 
So it's uh, it's all the way from startups where you are seeing uh, you know acceleration in terms of time to market, all the way through to large enterprises where you know burning problems are being solved using innovation and using low code as a way to uh, a way to get over a hurdle. So what I want to do today is just give you a little bit of background on low code, no code, what it means, a little bit of the tool sets, who are some of the interesting customers who or some of the you know use cases where you might have already used a low code uh, an application that's already built on low code or no code and then i'll also skip over to a quick uh quick and easy demo that uh, that shouldn't take any of you more than five minutes to do at home uh, just to bring all of this to light so i'm going to give you a bit of history because that's where that's how I came in contact with the whole no code, low code world. And there's a there's a bit of a profound message behind it. So, so this was way back in 2015. And if you look at it, so the Twitter was about, you know, close to 4,000 employees strong. And so, you know, they had been in business for a few years now, but, you know, and you can see on the screen what their website looked like at that point. Now, uh, at this point with Twitter, you know, running somebody um, who was looking at who was a non-tech person wanted to build something very similar so um, off he went and built a clone for twitter and he built this without writing a single line of code way back in 2015 and it took him you know about four days to build it right now what did this mean this so what it meant was a, a single user uh, or a single non-tech user uh, spending about four days, uh, you know, no, without knowing any any amount of coding, was able to build a clone for Twitter, right? And that was way back in 2015, where Twitter was running with about you know close to 4,000 employees, right? Now, uh, again, you know, if you so the so the website is called notrealtwitter.com, so if or even old notrealtwitter.com, if you go in there, you can still see this website live today. But this website, when you open up this website, it came up with this profound message. And I want to just walk you through that, right? Because it it probably defined how I moved into the whole low code, no code space. So first one is purpose, right? So they build it. So this person built that clone, not for a fresh new social media, because you know, God knows we don't need another social media uh, platform today. But at that point, he built it to show the future of software development, right? Because way back in uh, 2015, uh, the intention was that by 2020, uh, you, you, you know, most programmers won't be engineers. They're going to be doctors who are going to build applications for their patients uh, while sitting with them. Or farmers building applications to predict their uh, crop, uh, crop out output for the next five years. So that was a prediction that was given at 2015. And uh, to be honest, we're not, that, we're not that far away from those goals. But that was a reality back in 2015. And so what they did was they built this website without knowing any of the you know, coding languages that you would think about, PHP, HTML, CSS. And they built this without, you know, within four days. And what did this mean? So this meant that there was a, a huge shift in 2015 from the way traditional applications were being built. So when I say applications, websites, mobile apps, you know, your SaaS-based solutions, SaaS-based companies, et cetera, there was a completely different way from uh, from traditionally how softwares were being built. Not only was this true for smaller startups, but this was also true for very large enterprises as well. So what, what's happened since 2015 to you know, 2021? So let's just fast forward a little bit, right? So in 2015, there were about 50 odd companies that were in the no-code, low-code space. So what I mean by that is there were only about 50 companies who were supporting the whole no code, low code language, right? Or the visual editing language. But in 2020, that number has gone way more than 500. So you can pretty much think of, um, you know, it's niched down so much that you can think of low code, no code for marketing, for sales, for website, you know, for building chatbots, for building blockchain. So any, any sector you take, there's a no code solution that helps you build things in that sector. Now, you know, was, was this the only indication that this was going to be big? No, there were some really big companies uh, that also took investments or acqu acquisitions or build their own platforms. Um, as you might be aware, Microsoft came up with their Power Apps platform, uh, Google acquired AppSheets, AWS has a Honeycomb. So you could also see that these large tech companies who were so focused on coding and had, you know, you know close to 10,000 to 20,000 engineers was also starting to build products that would then help users like you and me to actually build 
build software without writing uh, code. So that was just a little bit of history to bring everyone uh, up to speed as to what's happened, uh, the history behind this, what was so interesting that happened in 2015, and, and also the way the industry has moved over the last six years. Now I want to just come back into what is no code, low code movement, right? So it's in, in, the, in, in its core, it's software that builds software. So rather than you trying to now build and write code that you've typically uh, had to do in the past, which is what we call traditional software development, you now move into a world where it's more drag and drop. So you are dragging things onto the screen. You are, you know, it's more, hey, when this happens, you know, that happens. So as, an, as a good example, right, what you see on the screen right now on the left-hand side is a, is, a, is a code that you had to write in the past if you wanted to make a, make a payment um, using PayPal as an example. And on the right, what, that's what it looks like using one of the no-code, low-code tools out there in the market. So it's, you know, it's very, very easy to understand for you. So you know it's a workflow. You know, you know when this button for PayPal API is clicked, you know, here are the things that needs to happen. Right? So you're moving away from you know, what is the line of code to okay, what is it that I want this software to do, that, and then it builds the software for me. So that's a little bit about no code, low code. So, and I, and I just want to dive in a little bit more, right? What you will see is that what no code and low code does is it makes software development accessible. So it makes it accessible to everyone in this world. You don't, you no longer have to be, you know, uh, you no longer have to spend years uh, in college learning about these technology platforms. Um, it's essentially software that it's democratizing the whole uh, development or coding industry. But then there's a little bit more to it, right? And I just want to maybe apply a few more points and thought process behind it. So uh, if you look at it, there's a lot of talk around automation in the entire, you know, in, in the world, you know, automation taking over certain jobs. And so similar to that, if you think about what no code or low code is, it's about applying automation in your encoding, essentially. So if you look at it, the last 80 years or 100 years, there's been little automation. Uh, there's been some automation. There's been little automation uh, in the whole coding industry, uh, the developmental industry, and that's what low code, no code is. Now, I just want to call out a quick difference between no code versus low code. So no code is purely drag and drop, right? Right. So that means that you can, you or I can just go in, drag and drop a few things, and uh, you know it publishes an app, and you're ready to go. While low code is a bit more advanced, where you can drag and drop, but then you can also add in additional custom, you know, code, which makes it a little bit more. That makes it that makes the the world of possibilities of using no code and low code even better. Now, question that typically comes out is, so what what can I build? So on the screen there, you saw an example of where you know you're building sort of a web app or a mobile application by just dragging and dropping things onto the screen, right? That's probably the simplest one. But you can extend this even further. You can build uh, blockchain-based solutions. You can build uh, bots that you know ask you questions when you come onto your website. You can actually build websites using no code. So we're we're moving away from hey, I want to worry about is it Java, is it C sharp? Do I need to find these kinds of resources in the in the industry? To I'm worrying more about what is the user experience that my customers want. What's the value that whatever I'm building gives to them, right? And it enables you to go to market much, much faster as well. So traditionally, if you, the, so the scale that I've seen in my experience is that traditionally, if you would have taken six months to get something out the market uh, with low code and no code, you can go by about one fourth to uh, half the time of that, right? So this is, um, making sure that everything is there. Uh, you can traditionally do it at about uh, one fourth to half the time that it took you. Now, one of the next questions is, okay, okay, I get no code, low code. I get the difference of it. I get, I can build it. So what can I, can you give me a little bit more detail around the tools that are being used? So just put up a simple, um, you know, a, a bunch, bunch of few logos, right? And I want to just maybe touch upon a few. And this is actually arranged based on, based on uh, the complexity so as an example, if you wanted to build up a, and launch a site in the next 24 hours, you'd use something like Card. It is, it's got built-in themes. It uh, enables anyone to just write a few things on your computer, just like how you would edit your Word document and you enable you to go live the next day, right? Versus something like Webflow, which is a bit more advanced and you want to launch something, uh, a, a website with a, a whole bunch of functionalities like login and a whole bunch of other things you would want to use something like, like Webflow. 
similarly, um, if you were running a, you know, a simple business and you wanted to have a page where people could just make a payment, something like checkout page will do that for you, you know, within, within the next 24 hours, versus something like Stripe, which has more customization, will need some amount of uh, low code um, or, or some amount of additional work. You need to know it a little bit more. But at, at, a, at, a, at an overall level, right, what is, you know, if you look at no code and low code, it's a bunch of tools that you have to learn. So be it card as an example, you just need to learn how to use card as a, again, a online drag and drop editor, and you can pretty much build those websites. I just wanna maybe touch upon maybe two more of these, right? So on one end, I'm gonna do a demo later on using bubble around which by where you can build a web application. So I'll show you how that can be done. Or on the other side for larger enterprises, you would use something like out systems because it gives you much more flexibility that you might need at an enterprise level. And similarly, there's a bunch of other applications. And this list, uh, the last time I checked it was, you know, closer to 600 tools out there um, that you can use today. So we touched upon what low code, low code is. We touched upon where it comes into play. And I just want to maybe take a minute to talk about two public case studies where you, know, you wouldn't have realized that you were using a, a, an application build using without writing a single line of code. And it might surprise you as well. So I just want to maybe touch upon that. So the first one is Yorkshire Building Society. Again, it's a public case study and I've put the link of that at the bottom. But if you ever apply for a mortgage uh, or apply uh, or on using YBS, uh, you, it's most likely that you would have used a, an application that was built without writing a single line of code, right? So that's one example of how, how YBS has been able to go from, um, go through the entire journey without writing uh, that single line of code. Now, another use case is if you've traveled recently, uh, post offices is a, is a really good one. Uh, I hope you've not traveled over the last one year, uh, but you know I'm assuming that we can all get back uh, out there. But if you use the travel money card by the post office, that's again, uh, build uh, without writing a, a lot of code. So it's use, using low code as a, as a way to, uh, to do this. So the, I just wanna give you two, two big examples of where low code has been adopted uh, in the industry today. And just so that you're aware, something like this travel money card has been already been used by about 100,000 people in the UK alone. So that just shows you that no code is no code, low code is not just for a single app or a single website that you need to put up, but it's 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 definitely there for you know much more complicated websites and mobile apps that you would want to build. Um, so what does this mean for innovators like like us, right? So on one side, uh, here are some of the challenges that I see, right? So on one side, I talk about about 600 tools out there. So how do you make the di distinction between which one's right for me? And obviously the answer is it's, you know, it's, it's more of a, a, I need to try something to see if it works and it fits for my business. Um, and there's obviously a learning curve associated with it, which means that it's, you're not, while you're not studying Java and C CSS, you're still learning to use a new, new tool. And these new tools sometimes can have very easy features and some complicated features, and that might take a bit of getting used to. Um, you're obviously, you know, moving into the whole space around scalability, security, how secure is, you know, I'm not even touching anything on security on my web application that I'm building using no code. How secure is it? And the traditional answer is that in most of the cases, it's secure by default, which means that the provider, so things like Bubble or App Systems takes care of that security for you. And all you are required to do is actually to build the experiences that you want to build for your um, end customers or consumers. And then obviously, you know, you need to look at performance and a few other things. So I hope this gave you a good understanding of you know, what was the history behind it, uh, why uh, and why is low code so relevant now? You saw some case studies where it's being used by a lot of enterprises in the UK and I'm also seeing the same thing uh, for startups as well. Um, and we also touched upon some of the challenges for innovators. Now I'll probably get to one of the most exciting parts of this, which is I'll give a quick demo and I wanna do it in, uh, well, we might potentially do just two of these, but first thing what I wanna do is I wanna build um, AI and machine learning are typically you know, meant for data scientists um, and it, it takes months of data processing. And I want to just bring uh, a simple use case where just using a browser and a camera, you can build a simple model. 
Um, I might also just do a quick uh, sign up page for London and Partners that we can just quickly mock up, right? And all of this will be published at the end of the end of this call. So I'm just going to quickly just uh, stop my sharing for a quick second, and I'm just going to bring up the pages. Right, so you should now see my screen uh, that talks. Uh, so we're going to just go through the first one, which is um, I'm going to do a quick uh, AI ML model to distinguish the numbers one, two, and three on my, you know, just using uh, these. So this is a website called Teachable Machines. So essentially you're teaching it what to do. So in this case, uh, again, I'm just going to run through this really quickly. I'm just going to run a simple uh, class, uh, a simple project. So I'm going to call this number one. So I'm essentially going to train the system to recognize that when I do this, that it detects that as number one. So I'm just going to open up my uh, webcam on this. So it's opened up and I'm just going to hold this. And I'm going to just give it different variations of what that looks like. Fairly simple. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to open up the webcam here and I'm going to do this. So this is another classic example of how you're training the system. And in this case, all I'm doing is I'm going to train the system to say, hey, if I do this, uh, tell me that it's the number one. And if I do this, tell me that it's the number two. Now, while I'm showing really a very simple use case, you can now think of the different, uh, different use cases that you could build around this. So as an example, you could now detect, uh, you know, if the, if the light is red or green, uh, when, let's say, if you are, you know, somebody with poor eyesight and you wanted something that would tell you if the light is red or green, this is something, a quick way for you to build that. Um, so this is, you know, so this is essentially train the model. And so as an example, if I do one now, oop, so uh, as you can see, it's, it's detecting certain things. It's detecting one when I do certain things. So you can see that it's learning as I'm doing these things. So, you know, when I do one, it's detecting that. When I do two, it's detecting the number two. So really simple way for you to build AI ML models where you're just using video um, or your own you know, images as a way to uh, build up these models. So that was use case number one. Uh, the second use case is, so this was teachable machines. So the second use case is something called a bubble. And this was, uh, this is a fairly straightforward web application. You can sign up for free on bubble.io. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to build a web application, uh, you know, just, just using drag and drop onto the screen, right? So let me just go in and do this, right? So I'm gonna create a new registration page. So a very simple registration page where I can then say, um, you know, something like, okay, I'm gonna have an input that, I have, you know, an input that, you get the idea. So here I'm gonna say, you know, email, and that's going to detect that as an email. Um, here you're going to you're going to add something like location, um, and you can add that in, and then you can pretty much say, okay, when this happens. So this one would be submit. So in this case, it's a you know, we're thinking of a registration page for London and Partners event. So they wanted to collect the email address. Let's say they wanted to collect the name uh, of the individual that's coming in, and so you wanted to save this this entire application. So right now. You know, this is a simple application, right? It doesn't do anything. So just as an example, if I just preview this application really quickly, it opens up that registration page. So this is a software. It's writing software for me. So if I open that up, you can already see that's there, but nothing happens when I hit submit. So what I'm going to do is when I hit, when I click on the submit, I'm going to say, start a workflow. So it's going to say, okay, when button submit is clicked, what do I want it to do? So in our case, I might want to create, um, you know, create something, or in this case, I want to maybe sign the user up as an example, right? So we are registering and signing up the user at the same time. So I can say, sign the user up, um, and I can say, okay, where does the email need to come from? So the email need to come from the input email as an example. Uh, that's value. I can add, you know, password. One, two, three by default as an example. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, send an email to confirm or I want to require a password confirmation. So these are all things that I can do. And so that signs up the user. So if I just preview it again, as an example, it will now allow me to click that submit button. 
So it's actually, you know, you can see that it's loading. So it says, hey, please include an email. So what it's doing for me is it's taking away the complexity behind uh, behind coding away. So all you are doing is, you know, just dragging and dropping a few things. So this is what I'd call completely no code. So you're dragging mm -hmm. and dropping a few things and you pretty much get an application up and running um, as an example. Um, I know we're, we're a bit short on time. So what I'm gonna do is uh, if we have time towards the end, I'm more than happy to do one more demo. Uh, but um, I hope that gave you a bit more of an insight into uh, low code, no code, the world around it. And you know some really simple examples that pretty much you can take away, take a look at it, and that will you know get you on your path to no code, low code. Thank you so much, Tanvir. Uh, really interesting to learn more about the functionality of, of low-code, no-code. I think hopefully, well, you've demonstrated how straightforward and easy it is to use. So hopefully everyone listening will be able to really roll that out in their organisations. I think the demo has really brought it to life. So yeah, if we have more time at the end, we'd love to see another one. Um, so I'm delighted to move us to our next part of the session which is really looking at how this technology uh, is almost rolled out in practice and how it can really drive innovation um, between kind of scale-ups and, and larger organizations. So very pleased to welcome uh, Tim Neen to our virtual stage. Uh, so Tim has worked in the pharma industry for over 25 years in many different roles all over the world uh, with a huge variety of commercial and leadership positions. Um, so very, very experienced uh, in his current position as co-founder and director of Cognomy. Tim is building a product that provides measurement and development solutions to assess, monitor and strengthen mental fitness for organisations globally. So Cognomy leverages their technology platform to provide insight and measurement on this critical topic for employers and utilises their international community of mental fitness experts to provide positive, proactive learning, coaching and support to develop mental fitness. Uh, so welcome, Tim. Uh, I know I've given a brief overview there of Cognomy, but it would be great to hear from you a little bit more about the mission uh, you're working towards and kind of your, your role within the organisation. Uh, thanks, Lauren. It's my great pleasure to be with you today. Um, yeah, and thanks, Tanvir. Um, I, I always learn from the conversations we've been we've been working with Tanvir and UST in in developing our technology solution uh, in, in order to provide this um, service in in terms of mental fitness. And I mean, men mental fitness. We started up with startup organisation a couple of years ago. So prior to COVID, in really championing this principle of how to work on what's happening within our brain, how to strengthen and develop what's, what's going on within each of us in our brain and in recognition of the increasing challenge that exists in, in society today and the increasing issues that are, 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 are raising regarding mental health. We very much champion in the principle of building and strengthening mental fitness in the positive, proactive way. So thinking about mental fitness is what, what you think about in, in terms of physical fitness below the shoulders, it's mental fitness above the, above the head. Now, over the course of this past year, COVID has really accelerated the, uh, the recognition from organisations that we need to, to, to do something different to really start to look after all the people that, that, that we work together with and, and, and take a different approach to recognizing that mental fitness is something that we all have uh, we're all at different phases and if you can work and develop and strengthen the key things that are important for you then then that's going to have a massive impact on every element of your life and and how much ultimately you can deliver and perform in a, in a work environment mm -hmm. so it's a, it's a tremendously hot topic and, and and i think in relation to that yeah, everything. This model of us is about of ours is about data and developing uh, a tangible measure in what has traditionally been, you know, wellness is a, an intangible, fluffy subject. We really wanted to make this exceedingly measurable, um, and 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 data is is a critical part of what we do because based on the data, then we have a series of innovations that we started up with. And then we've developed over the past couple of years and then we measure outcome and we can talk about return and investment and, and really understand then that this kind of iterative process that we can help people through. So if you can grasp that as a concept, then obviously technology becomes a critical element of that because for us to capture the data, the insights, we, we want to build a, an effective technology platform that can facilitate that process for us. And so 
that's what we've worked with um, with UST in in doing and uh, in that creating that kind of flexible technology enabled solution where we could react as quickly as we've needed to be uh, and as we've needed to as our service has evolved and developed as quickly as it has in relation to how much the international uh, market has, has evolved mm. and we're delighted now that we've 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 been able to put together very quickly a technology solution um, that's, that means that we can connect our international community of coaches with the international uh, clients that we've got and yet still uh, manage to, to uh, support the business as we've gone through this very rapid phase of growth that we've, uh, yeah. that we've been able to do over, over the past couple of years. Yeah. And I mean, you've touched on it a little bit there, i.e. kind of that notion of being able to respond quickly and kind of the flexibility and, and ability to scale rapidly that kind of low code technology can really provide. But it'd be great if you could kind of tell us a little bit more about, yeah, your approach to using that, um, you know, low code or no code approach within your kind of digital product builds, yeah. how you feel it really helps you scale. Um, and we'll, we'll come on in a moment to talk about how that then helps you work in partnership, but from a kind of, you know, smaller organization perspective how has mm. that really enabled you to, to scale your impact yeah. no I, mean, I think lauren as tambi just talked about when he was describing the organizations that can benefit from um low code no code it, it fits perfectly um for for what we've been able to what we've needed to do you know, we wanted we, we were building out the business in the early days and knew that the principles of the model that we were implementing with clients but the kind of proof of concept stage we were building out um, behind the scenes was, was clunky. <laughs> and so we needed very quickly then to develop the technology to support that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we looked at the different options, uh, you know, a full build of, um, of, of, of exactly the solution that we want. We thought that we wanted at the time, yeah. um, but, you know, with great guidance and advice from the different partners like Tanvir, but, you know, other experienced the, uh, um, advisors as well it, 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 the low code no code option just fitted perfectly for us because we knew where we needed to go we knew what the solutions that were that we wanted to initially pilot and develop but we knew uh, that there was a lot more that we wanted to achieve and and the the principles of low code code enabled us to get very quickly from a kind of proof of concept to a product and Tambia talked about that speed of development I came from corporate pharma, and that's where I grew up in the, in the corporate world. And the, the recognition from all the projects that I went through and the build, different builds that I went through was how long this took uh, to then get to a, a solution. And it was just uh, a, a practically revolutionary for me to see how quickly the agile uh, production process could be with low code, no code, for us to get to an exceedingly viable and very good solution and, and to go from zero to launch in under 12 weeks was, was quite amazing for me. Um, and so we had a viable uh, and functioning platform uh, that we could um, deliver um, projects for within basically just over 11 weeks, we fully launched that and, and functioning as well, which um, really fitted the speed of development for us. But alongside that, it was then we, we leveraged out systems, which um, as Tambia talked about as, as the platform uh, and, and that just facilitated, uh, you know, that, that ability to bring in already tested technology and solutions that the, the no code that we could incorporate within what we needed to yeah. bespoke and develop because what we are doing in terms of mental fitness has not been done at all before. Yeah. Um, so the, our principle of measurement data uh, and then this matching process to our international uh, community of mental fitness coaches the leverage and capturing of, of data through that coaching process yeah. um, and, and and the the metrics that we can then incorporate uh, in, in uh, to make sure that 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 uh, matching process is successful you know none of that's been built before but we were able to leverage low code code to very very quickly do that yeah. and i i was a, a key pro, a director of cognome as you said before and I, I i took responsibility with the tech team with the build team to really you know drive that process without the knowledge and ex expertise 
but but still with the principle of what do we want to deliver and what do we want to achieve and and with that I, I could I could still manage that that development of the process very effectively and see like you know I, I don't like that I want it to do this and how quickly you can you can make those changes yeah um, and and that was that was really um, perfect kind of solution for us to build build out what we needed to. Yeah. And I mean, you've had several very successful partnerships with really large organisations. Um, one in particular that stands out is your work with the NHS. Um, I don't know if you're able to tell us a little bit more about that and how, you know, your low code or no code approach really supported that partnership and allowed you to really develop tailored solutions to their innovation challenges. Um, very happy to share some of that. The NHS is uh, it's one of the, I think it's still the largest employer on, on the planet. And so it's a massive uh, organisation. Um, and, you know, certainly in the, in, in the UK, London, we've all appreciated more about the, the challenges within, uh, with op operating within the NHS. And yeah, more than ever, um, I, I've been delighted to be able to support key members within the NHS over the over the course of the past year with uh, developing, strengthening mental fitness, creating an understanding of about so, how some of the challenges of the of the frontline uh, critical workers have, have been um, have been evolving and, and changing over over the past year. Um, and so, what we've been really pleased to see is the NHS um, have very large and and actually still um still developing client client for us and they they commissioned cognomi to provide one-to-one -one coaching support to primary care leaders there, there is a, 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 a i don't think it's it, it's one of those things that's not advertised a, a, enough really is that the kind of uh, support the national focus on supporting primary care leaders mm -hmm. that there is in, in terms of personal development leadership development mm -hmm. um in the nhs and in we're used to healthcare practitioners um, very technically uh, developed, but this element of personal development, leadership development, is is not something that's really leveraged in, within the NHS. And, and so, we're working with in partnership with with different arms of the NHS to help help to develop uh, those kind of competencies and skills, using the the process of, of building understanding more about mental fitness yeah. in order to then take a personal step at transformation and learning and, and development and that's uh, that can really make a, a huge difference to the individuals going through that now as, as the nhs is so big the solutions that we we've had to work with have been integrating within the different development solutions within primary care trust a, across different geographies all with different approaches um integrating within group learning uh, exercises within different kind of functions within the NHS and so that ability to personalize the the project yeah. and then on an individual basis make sure it still feels a very personalized process has been critical so for each one of the projects we know there is some elements of bespoking that we we would have to we'd have to develop and 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 what's what's been fascinating to watch is as we've just within the NHS as we looked at different projects is different innovations that we've been able to deliver very quickly mm. whether that's uh, a, a team kind of fitness un understanding whether that's a you know a group um auditing process of where we are with mental fitness and show how that's transitioned over time you know all of these different kind of solutions innovations have come up as we've as we've evolved and delivered a project and so we want to be able to deliver that very quickly and and so the low code option facilitates that process of very speedy evolution and development um, you know we can work with our tech developers to you know within a within a very short space of time come up with a new solu solution that we that we can add into what we're delivering and yeah. then actually test it in in, um, in real time with um, with clients yeah um, totally. oh sorry tim to just to, I guess it's, it's really about that kind of pace and personalization that almost de-risks some of the kind of challenges that, that you know, if you're a corporate innovation team and you want to try something, it's, it's a really easy way to kind of get certain ideas and kind of concepts off the ground and embedded into an organization in a really 
kind of straightforward way that you know perhaps doesn't send your IT or kind of tech teams running scared <laughs> with kind yeah. of huge integrations and, no, and 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 not ending up with um something that you actually is not right right exactly um, right, yeah. I, I've been in that situation as, um, as I'm sure every one of us on online has is that you you end up with a, a, a tech solution which actually is just not quite what you wanted uh, and and because you've gone through that kind of long high coding process it's, it's much harder to then to come back and, and change things and and yeah. I've, I've certainly found this this the, the low code no code kind of approach in combination with a really agile process project process has just been highly effective for delivering for an organization like us where we have to react very quickly as the, the whole marketplace is is developing so rapidly it's yeah. it's really fitted the model for us highly effective Definitely. Um, I'm really keen to bring in some of the great questions in the chat, quite technical ones. So um, I think it would be great to kind of get your both of your sort of inputs on these. Um, I'll come to kind of Tanvir first, um, a question from Krish. Uh, what is the difference between low code, no code platforms versus um, platforms like GoDaddy or Wix? Yeah, so Krish, great question. I think Wix is a type of no code platform. So is GoDaddy. So essentially, these are no-code platforms that are uh, written up as, hey, you know, you build your domain, buy your domain with us, and then build your websites with us. So it's that same concept. So again, you can go to your Wix, drag and drop editor, very simple. Um, again, like I said earlier, you know, within one or two days, you can pretty much master everything and then launch your website in there. I hope that helps. Great. Uh, yeah, Krish, let us know if that's if that's answered your question. Um, another one, um, perhaps again for Tamvir, and then uh, Tim, I'll come to you with the next. Um, so, in your opinion, who are the leaders in no-code, low-code solution providers in terms of most of third-party APIs available for integration? And that's from Syed. Uh, yeah, Syed. So again, great question. I think uh, different people will give you different answers on this one. But um, if you again, and it'll depend upon the use case that you have as well. But if I were to give you one of them, uh, it would definitely be, um, it'll definitely be somewhere between Zapier, so or another one that's that's similar to Zapier. So what Zapier does is it's your, it's your connector ecosystem. So I think right now they've got close to thousand APIs or connectors that's already available out of the box that you can use for pretty much anything. So that's being used by marketers, sales guys building websites and a whole bunch of other things. I hope that helps as well. Great, thank you. Um, so Tim, I think maybe one for you on this one. So this is from Paul and he says, perhaps the obvious one, does no code, low code obviate the need to learn coding for the majority of roles in a startup scale up, even in the dev team? What coding training would you perhaps advise a young tech entrepreneur or apprentice to take on if kind of, you know, there's, they're using these sorts of products? Oh, really good question. I, I can answer the, the first bit of that highly effectively in saying yeah from, <laughs> from, my, from my perspective yet yeah, uh, if i look at the my knowledge of coding versus my children's it's it's very different um, and and yes we've been able to uh, i've been able to work very effectively with the development team to uh, to build this um, this this process and so coding definitely uh, knowledge is not a requirement what we we've, we've had to bring in is the, is the people that could function with with in, in our case out systems and so that knowledge and ability to be able to leverage the tool that you and the platform that you're you're let, you're you're accessing is has been critical for us. But the steering, that's and the strategic kind of thought process, the direction of what we wanted to do, that's that's where I, I've been really to be able to to bring the value uh, alongside the technical expertise that um, that we brought in. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, perhaps around the kind of, um, you know, the new approach to coding training, given the kind of changing landscape around this. Yeah, uh, what I'd say is this is still, you know, six years on since that first, you know, Twitter clone was built. I'd still say that we're still in the early days of the whole no code, low code movement. Mm. Um, uh, the way you should look at it is, uh, you know, you should still tie that to some form of coding. Because I think what coding has always done for pretty much every industry out there is it's given a basis for which how you convert logic that sits in your brain to logic that the computer can understand. Mm -hmm. And I think no code is an abstraction layer about that. So there's no harm in learning uh, that detailed coding. So you could do something like Java um, as, or JavaScript as probably the first thing you take on. 
-hmm. but all it does is ena it enables you to understand no code even better. Mm. Great, good answers um, and great questions. Keep them coming in. Um, another question uh, from Ricky. Um, I'm not sure who would like to take this one. Can you transition easily between low code tools? Can you export import the code generated? Uh, yeah, so uh, again, quite technical in nature. I think it'll it'll vary from each of those 600 platforms that are uh, alive today. Um, I'd say about 80% of them would not allow you to export the code out and convert it into something else. But there's still going to be that 20% who pretty much write standard open source code that you can then pretty much take and deploy it elsewhere. Or, you know, it again, at the end of the day, it's just code at the at the back. So if you've got the knowledge on that particular code, you can still go in and you know maintain it yourself, but there's no backward compatibility. So that's the only disadvantage of using that. Uh, in sort of an answer, again, a question back to you, that would be, you know, if you're already on the local journey, there's very little reasons for you to move back into a traditional mode of coding. So again, this has to be like life or death reasons why you would want to move back as well. Mm. I hope that gave you a little bit more perspective. Brilliant. Um, so I'm kind of going to continue with a few questions that I have in addition. So please, if there are other questions from the audience, do do continue to pop them in the chat. We'll um, we'll definitely get to them. Um, so I think one question I have is, you know, if you're a corporate innovator sitting within a large, you know, obviously you mentioned uh, the Yorkshire Building Society earlier. You know, that's a great example. How do you potentially think about changing your strategy around innovation and your approach to that in order to build in low code, no code, um, and actually kind of accelerate that and embed that. I mean, I don't, Tanvir, maybe if you can kick us off and then Tim, I'd love to come to you for your thoughts. I'd say that first of all, it's breaking boundaries of how, you, how you've been doing innovation up until that point. Mm. I think uh, as Janet explained at the beginning around the uh, open innovation ecosystem and the cohort, I think that's one thing that's happened to me, which is a radical transformation from how I used to see innovation to how I see it today. So today, for me, it's more about how do I connect different parties together, uh, et cetera. And that's what I'd, I'd say low code also does. It's a, it's a way for you to, within your existing enterprise, it's a way for you to connect you know, various systems quite quickly. Mm. It's giving you the ability to iterate much, much faster. Mm. Um, and, also at a, and also enables you to think that 10 steps ahead of everyone else. Um, Lauren. So all good things, really. I mean, Tim, I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on this, especially kind of given your big pharma corporate background. You know, do you see that perhaps it had this been more of a kind of movement when you were there that, that it could have been more adopted across those big organizations and that perhaps it would have been more, you know, accessible? Um, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think in terms of driving the innovation um, process itself, what I, what I can see um, this um, not being web wedded to a, a standardized process way of, of functioning and operating and that ability to actually come up with new solutions, either internally yourself or connecting with, with other partners. Um, that, that's, I, I, can, I can on a daily basis feel the difference in, in terms of how the speed of development of, of how we can function yeah. because of that. Um, that uh, in terms of driving further innovation, that ability to connect with with different partners that um, that have developed other solutions which are very complementary, we mm. just have that much more flexibility to be able to do that to ultimately produce a, a, a better solution for a, for a client. Yeah. And we see that with a number of the projects where we're working with a big professional consultancy organisation, and, and we we proposed and, and developed a, a, a new solution together with another organization and that's been we've been able to evolve that very quickly mm. um I, I don't i don't think you could you could function with that kind of speed um without this the, the the inherent flexibility that we've been able to build into, into the platform that we've got now so it's fitted brilliantly for the stage of the business that we've got but now i can see how as we continue to drive um, the, the, the solutions that we can offer to clients, how, how quickly we can respond to that. It really serves that function very well for us going forward. Yeah, and I mean, from everything that we've heard today, it, it feels like everyone should just be using these types of platforms and building everything on these sorts of kind of functionalities. I mean, are there challenges that come with this 
technology or kind of this approach and, and if so what are they and, and how might kind of you know people who engage or kind of use this um you know overcome those challenges or, or limitations um i'll go first maybe tanvir and you you can tell me whether you agree with me or not <laughs> um, i mean ultimately what you're developing is your solution but the the building blocks are, are from somebody else and so you've got this you're not developing a bespoke completely your own code environment and so um I mean, but the, the benefits of that are actually the solution that you're able to provide is is out on the market that much quicker and that actually you can continue to evolve and develop that yeah. and it ultimately is your IP and your solution um, so I mean there is a de definite ownership uh, of, of coding um, and in, in, there's the in, uh, theoretical uh, risks associated with that but the reality is that you you, when you think about the, the solution that you're that we're providing to the marketplace is that they we're able to react to that so quickly and move things along effectively um yeah. so I, I i i think depending on the size and the scale of the organization how much resources you can allocate to mm. a project that's going to guide you as to making these kind of decisions and certainly for an organization at the stage that we were at, this gave us the flexibility and certainly the pricing uh, approach, which really fitted for, you know, a startup entrepreneurial business that knew that we still had uh, a number of evolutions to go through. Mm. Um, if you've got the, the, the kind of budgetary support, uh, then, then you, uh, the, you could throw the resources that you could develop things as quickly as, as you'd like to, then, then you've, you've got some different decisions to make, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Tanvir, I'd love to kind of have your thoughts on that, and especially from a kind of perspective of maybe larger organisations or clients that you work with, you know, perhaps those where, you know, there are huge corporates or kind of institutions. Yeah, so uh, I'll just maybe touch upon a few examples, right? So what we saw a use case where a large financial institution was using no code. So we know that it works with the finance industry. Yeah. Uh, we know that, uh, so as an, another example, we know that you know, like the NHS, they use low code, no code in certain parts of their business. I think the, uh, I think, you know, to your question, right, Lauren, I think, you know, pretty much even I'm of the same opinion that, you know, everything should be built on low code, no code, because that is sort of where, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, advancement, a lot of pain points being just taken away. Yeah, mm. that, that's traditionally always been there. But you would still come across certain scenarios where you would always want to, you know, have that flexibility of, uh, of uh, having a developer write certain things certain way, mm. because at the end of the day, it's a software writing software. So yeah. it depends upon the functionalities that that, you know, that primary software provides on what it can write. So as an example, if if if, if the software that you've chosen to build no code tools does mm. not allow you to, let's say, as an example. Um, uh, send an SMS as an example, then you're stuck, right? So it's also about choosing the right platform, knowing the ins and out of it, and then uh, and then making that uh, that decision. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, I think um, I'll sort of come to a last question from the chat um, before I kind of wrap up, which is from Nur. So any low code, no code providers that you might recommend um, that perhaps are kind of you know easiest to use or have the biggest functionality? Uh, yeah, so I think. Um, um, I, I'm just going to put this up back again, but, uh, you know, if you are somebody who's just starting out in your journey and you just want to sort of get to know some of the software and what it can do for you, pick up something on the, on the left-hand side of the screen to, you know, just feel free to grab a screenshot of this. But mm. if you're looking for more enterprise level, more in the medical sector or you know, larger financial organization for larger enterprises, you potentially would want to start on the right-hand side of that scale. Mm. Um, I, I hope that helps. No. All good, really. Yeah, no, all good examples. I think um, final question is, um, you know, could you get back end database data access if you use these platforms? Is that an yeah. option? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, those are parts, uh, part and parcel of what most of these provide. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd just add to that in that, <laughs> that principle of how, to, how we made decisions. It was looking at the very clear case studies from the different organizations that were there and that really guided us as to 
mm. you, you will be able to pick what they've worked upon, whether the similarities were with what you, you are working towards, because mm. then you know you've got coding that you'd be able to suck across. Um, yeah. And, and that, that, that's a highly effective way of helping to, to select the right kind of provider. Mm, yeah, that's a really good piece of advice to kind of end on, I think. I mean, a huge thank you uh, to Tanvir and to Tim for joining us today and sharing kind of their insights into this into this space, which seems maybe scary, but it's really straightforward and everyone sounds like they should be using it to just, as you say, Tim, kind of really remove those pain points and I guess work at the sort of pace that perhaps, you know, sometimes is what kind of holds back innovation strategies from moving forward. And I think it's a really exciting space. Um, you know, obviously we'd love to connect you into any of our attendees who potentially would be like, would um, like to learn more from you. Uh, so if you're happy for that, we can maybe facilitate some connections after the fact, because I think there are definitely some people that would love to kind of learn a little bit more. Um, but a huge thank you for both of you for your time, for your demos, Tanvir. It's been brilliant. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone else for, for joining us and for your brilliant questions. It's been a really lively discussion. Um, and I hope, yeah, you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I think um, myself and the team will stay on, on the call. Should anyone have any kind of questions, um, maybe more practical questions about either London Partners, the Open Innovation Fellowship, how they can maybe connect to Tanvir or Tim. Um, so yeah, we'll stay on the line. And if you've got any questions that you'd like to ask us now, please do stay on and, and ask us. But otherwise, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Tanvir. Thank you, Tim. Bye now.